We want to welcome you to Torah on the Go. Wherever you are right now, whether you are on your uh, Stairmaster or whether you're in the car on the way to work, Rabbi Feinstein and I want to learn with you right now at this moment. We want to thank you for joining us. Rabbi Feinstein, it's good to sit here with you. Nice to see you, Rabbi. <laughs> we see each other all the time. So, uh, so if you're we, late for work, right. <laughs> take a breath. We're going to give you a little spirit as you get on your way. Here we go. Torah on the Go is going to tackle the topic of Genesis this year. So we're going to study the book of Genesis, not only according to the Parshiot, but according to big themes and motifs that, uh, that appear throughout not only Genesis, but also the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible at large. So we're going to begin this episode with a kind of broad question, and that is simply, why study the Bible? Why pay attention to the teachings of the Tanakh? How is it relevant in our lives today? Well, actually, I want to start with a slightly different question. Okay. See, the enemy of great learning, the enemy of great reading in any field, but most especially in ours, in religion, is familiarity. It's natural for parents to have told us Bible stories when we were kids, but the problem is that those Bible stories are then fused in our minds as if they're childish. They're part of the kid's world. In order to break out of that and to realize that these are deeply adult concerns, this is a way of conveying adult truth to adults. We have to push away pretty much everything we ever knew about these stories and read them again for the first time. So let's start with a little silliness for a moment. <clears throat> Did the guys who wrote the Bible knew they were writing the Bible? And if they didn't know they were writing the Bible, what do you suppose they thought they were writing? The Bible has no title page. The Torah that we read in synagogue has no title page, no author's introduction, no preface, none of those things that say, this is how you ought to read the book. Not even the line on the cover that says, suggested by real events. This thing is completely open to our imagination, how we take this text. So let's push away everything we know about this text and read it again for the first time and be surprised by what we find there. So just building off of that for a moment, um, I think the Bible has served civilization as a kind of meta-narrative for a long time. People connected with it from the time they were children to the time they were adults, constantly delving deeper and deeper, both in terms of familiarity and in terms of understanding. But what's happened recently, if there is a crisis of biblical literacy, it's because we lack a concept of communal meta narrative. Well, we lack a concept of narrative. I mean, we're, we're all used to people telling us the truth straight. My accountant says, you know, you spend too much on something, or my wife says you spend too much on something, or the government tells us. I mean, the whole notion of learning a story right. and being able to decode that story and finding a truth that is deeply embedded in that story. Why is that story there? Because an ancestor of ours wanted us to know a truth, some way to walk the world, to live a life, that's remarkable, a life that is significant, a life that is happy. And they put that truth into the form of a narrative because, as you said, it appeals to everybody on every level, and it keeps coming back to us. These, these stories we read every year because every time we read them, we find new stuff in there. So let's begin by noting that narrative itself takes an extra measure of concentration and energy to decode so that we can find the truth down in there. That process isn't something that people are necessarily born with. It's something that we learn over time, mm -hmm. the idea of valuing narrative. That's parents sitting at bedsides and reading stories right before bed. I would also argue that, it's, that I'm old enough uh, to have taken a class in college called Western Civilization. Okay? Now, Western Civilization itself was a, a kind of construct. There is no such thing necessarily as Western civilization. But in it, you read a course reader of important texts mm -hmm. that a person should know that makes us who we are. Now, that started with the Bible. The first text we read was Genesis. The second text we read was Exodus. The third text we read was Homer. The fourth text we read was Plato, as if all these things, you know, through St. Augustine, through, through 
Chaucer through Machiavelli. Through, these were the people who made Western civilization. And the next semester, we read non-Western civilization. So we started with Confucius, and we went through, um, uh, you know, Islamic writers, and we went through um, writers from Africa, tribal writers. In the inclusivity, in, in the rush towards inclusivity and the breakdown of, of Western civilization and the, in the reduction of it all, I think that we also, both as Jews and as Americans and as Westerners living in 2023, have pushed aside the Bible as foundational, pushed aside the, the value of this narrative in particular, because we're trying to weight all narratives as, as valuable which is not a wrong inclination. But in trying to say that everything is valuable, we have lost the fervor for this particular narrative that's so crucial to who we are as Jews. And the other thing I would point out is that when we read Bible, we sort of imagine, which I guess is the internal narrative of the text itself, that this thing was dropped on us from heaven. Now, there's an advantage to reading it that way, of course, you know. That's uh, the way our Orthodox brothers and sisters read it. It gives the text an incredible power of, uh, of authority and authenticity. But what we lose in reading of that is that the Bible was created within a cultural context. That is, there were narratives in the world, and this narrative rose among them as an argument against them, as a selection among them, in order to point out, here's a better way. Here's a different way to think about yourself. So one of the things you might want to do, by the way, is as we're reading Bible, and we'll be doing this this year together, is think of the narratives that govern our, our, our civilization now. And one of the narratives that I grew up with, probably you grew up with as well, is the cowboy narrative. Um, it doesn't have to be cowboy, by the way, on a horse. The Batman, Superman, the, the lone hero who shows up and cleans up things and fixes problems, strange visitor from a faraway planet who comes to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond mortal men, um, all men for some reason. Uh, I guess Wonder Woman comes as a corrective. But the idea of the singular hero, that's one of the narratives of Western civilization. The Bible is going to come and question that. It's going to talk about social context, about societies, it's very interesting to compare biblical civilization with the narratives we live with and to see the conversation among narratives, to become sensitive to that. That gives the text a real livelihood, a real power. Both of us have a friend by the name of Mark Brettler mm. who likes to teach, rather than authorship of the Bible, authorships of the Bible. Right. And in doing so... Uh, we recognize that it's not a, it's never been a problem for the Jewish people to recognize that the author of Esther is probably not the author of Samuel. You know, that's a very controversial idea. Right. You know, I mean, <laughs> Especially in this room. I don't know that I don't know that I said anything controversial it's a very yet, controversial but controversial room, right. you know. Someone's just gonna crash their car on the Hollywood freeway because of that. But um, I think that once we get to the core of the Torah and we start talking about is it possible that the author of Genesis 1 is not the author of Genesis 2, or is it possible that Genesis and Exodus come from different contexts? Mm -hmm. um, then we begin, for some people, start to threaten the, the, the core foundational text, they think, of the Jewish people. Right. So who wrote I, the Bible? Who wrote the Bible? But I, the I Bible? actually think that what it means is something really beautiful. The idea that we included contradictory notions about humanity, about mankind, about God, and we call that a holy text from which we learn, I think that's actually, that's what makes this such a sanctified endeavor. Right. The, 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 the image is instead of a singular author, instead of Moses on Mount Sinai with a ballpoint pen scribbling down what God's whispering to him, think about the best Shabbos dinner or the best Passover Seder you ever had with your family. There was an argument at the table. But it wasn't an angry argument. Well, it's some families. It wasn't an angry argument. It was a principled argument about politics, about morality, about ideas. Um, that's what I remember from the family that I grew up in. And if you think about the Bible as that table, as a dinner table where a family of brilliant, sensitive souls gathers together to converse about the biggest questions of life. What is life for? What is the meaning of death? 
Why is there evil in the world? What is the meaning of gender, of male, female, and others? What is the meaning of work and rest? These are the great questions of life, and it's a conversation. And there's room for almost everyone in that conversation. Because think of the Bible, there's room for Job and Kohelet, the two most heretical books you can possibly imagine. And there's room for Leviticus, which is the most conventional book, the most straight book you can possibly imagine. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And the idea that it, the lesson that it teaches us today isn't only the text itself. It's how to read and appreciate something that you love, how to read and appreciate something, parts that you might detest. Yeah. How, can, how to, can, can you argue with it? That's exactly right. Can I object to this? That, right. That's exactly right. Can I, can I object to it and can I still appreciate it at the same time? Right. Because it's all part of us. The Bible is, a, is, is the ultimate narrative that runs through us as human beings uh, and connects us with humanity at large. And so, so Thursday morning, you know, I do, I do Minion with the day school kids. I've been doing this for many, many, many years. We do questions and answers. I call it She'elot to Chuvot, questions and answers. They call it Stump the Rabbi. The question that always comes up, it's going to come up in around three weeks as they start reading their Chumash, their Torah, is, Rabbi, if... Um, if Adam and Eve were the only two people in the world and they only had two boys, how did the world get full of people? And it's such a wonderful question for a third grader to ask mm -hmm. because what the kid's asking us is, is this stuff really true? Mm -hmm. Is this true? Mm -hmm. And if it's true, how come it don't make sense? Mm -hmm. And how do I make sense of something that doesn't seem to make sense with my knowledge and experience of the world? In what way... Is it true? And then, you know, a second grader wants to know where the dinosaurs right. in the beginning of Genesis, right. right? And a fourth grader wants to know, you know, how come Moses kills the Egyptian instead of talking him out of hurting that Hebrew? So how do you answer the question, is it true, Rabbi? So when I was uh, in fourth grade at Solomon Schechter in Northbrook, Illinois, we had a chumash ceremony. Everyone was handed a chumash. And this was part of our learning, the beginning of engaging with the text itself. And we learned out of... Chumashim in Hebrew with Rashi, very, very traditional text, nothing like our kids receive today in school. And I'll never forget the principal of the school. His name was Jay Lieberman. Okay, now he's the head of school, I think, in Cleveland. I know Jay. Yeah. And Jay Lieberman held the Chumash in front of all of us and said, this is not a history book. But if you read it enough times, you'll know where we come from. I thought to myself, is he nuts? What does that even mean? I remember thinking fourth grade, like, fourth this, grade. Is, this is, what is he saying? Now, I remember that statement. Think about all the things you've been taught in your life and how you forget so many of them. And that statement, Jay loved to sit us on the floor and tell stories about the Baal Shem Tov. He loved to tell, there were so many things that Jay brought to, brought to us as, as, as children. But this one statement that he made has stayed with me my entire life. It is not a history book. And if you read it like that and say, is this true history? The answer is, I don't know, and it doesn't matter to me. Another teacher and friend of both of ours, um, Rabbi Bradley Shavit Artson, um, often says, if you read the Bible, and at the very end, you come to a question, the question is, I wonder how tall Abraham was. <laughs> You've missed the point. Turn back to page one, start again. It, these are Those questions, the idea that you can stump the Bible, the Bible's not interested in being stumped. That's not the point of it all. Is to is to you know induce those types of questions. Did this really happen? Right. And that's and that's often the the I find the most childlike questions, and they're charming when they're said by children. When they're said by adults to us, and both of us have had this had this experience. What it means is that that person, as a reader, has not developed through their lifetime. Right, where well, they, they stopped reading it as kids, and that's where they live. That's exactly right. Right, so an adult reading. But I, what I love about the questions, of course, is that just beneath the kid's um, idiom of the question is a very deep question. You know, you told me this is true, but it doesn't make sense. Right. Or it, doesn't, it either doesn't make scientific sense or it doesn't make moral sense. Help me with that contradiction. Well, there's a difference between lowercase true, lowercase t, truth, and uppercase T, truth. And that's, I think, what the Tanakh is inviting us to understand is, is it possible that the flood, Noah's flood, wiped out all of humanity? Is that, is that what the claim is, is that scientifically there was a flood that wiped out the world? 
And is it the same flood that's recounted in Gilgam? Is it, the, is, it the, is it the same iconic legendary flood that so many different cultures remember? Or are we to take out of this that what God wants from us is the ability to start over and reach towards righteousness, even in a world that is filled with Hamas, filled with the worst vitriolic, you know, animosity? Right. And I think the, the other question of truth, and it's important for those who are listening to us to grasp this, this is going to challenge you. This, is going to, this text, if you do read it as an adult, if you, if you are open to its deepest truths within its narratives, this is going to challenge you. This is going to shove you hard. Take the story you said. What's the story of Noah? Well, it's charming. It's a guy who builds a bow. He brings giraffes and hippopotamuses. It's the question that we human beings have the capacity to destroy the world as we know it. And God is not going to stop us. Nothing's going to stop us. That realization, when you look at the, the families we've built, the things that we love, that realization is a frightening realization to take it seriously, to really take it to heart. And then the question of if, if you were given the chance to save something within this world from this onslaught of animosity, from this onslaught of, of, this, of destruction, what's worth saving? Noah's told, take animals, take life. What would we save? What's worth saving? And that's a profound question of what's of ultimate value to you at this point in your life, at this point in your perception of the civilization we live in. These kinds of questions, when we get to the Abraham story, similar kinds of questions. What's it like to perceive the truth when the whole world sees you as a lunatic, right? What's it like to teach that truth to the world? And how much sacrifice are you prepared to make to carry that truth forward? These kind of questions then, they, if you really read it as a, as a grown-up, leave you unsettled. They leave you unsettled. And that's why this book is so profound. I think if you correctly read the book of the Hebrew Bible, which, by the way, is the best-selling book of all time. So we didn't pick some not well-known, um, didn't sell well. We're not trying to sell people something that, uh, that isn't already, that can't stand on its own two feet. But I want to just make the case for it for a moment. The Bible teaches you how to engage in a text, which is why I think that children are taught the Bible from an early age. To train them to think as Jews and to think as critical thinkers we open up the Torah and we make them read and decide for themselves ideas of truth, ideas of family, ideas of morality, ideas of relationship, and our relationship not only within our own community but to outside communities. Children come to us and say, I agree or I disagree. They don't often do that with math. <laughs> they don't often do that with history. Right, right. They don't, th this, for some reason, invites the reader to say, I agree, I disagree, I'm challenged, I wonder why more people don't, don't adhere to this. Mm -hmm. And there aren't unlimited texts that invite people to do that. Right. And, and I think it, it adds one more layer to the way that we think about ourselves. You, you know, the Bible's full of commandments, according to the tradition it's 613, which was a made-up number. It's 365 days of the year, 248 parts of the body gives you 365. The first one everybody knows. The first commandment in the Torah is pru or vu, fill the world with life. You know what the last commandment is? The last, the 613th commandment in the, in the Torah is write your own Torah. Write your own Torah. And the rabbis were very specific. It doesn't matter if your father gave you one, your mother gave you one. And I think what they mean here is don't rewrite Moses' Torah. Write yours. In other words, you are invited at the end of this project to create a narrative of your own life to leave for posterity, to add your voice to that dinner table conversation about the meaning of human existence. It's really not a passive process at all. It's a very active process of engaging in these questions, of telling these stories, exploring the depth of these stories, and then adding your voice so that sometime in some future, and we'll have flying cars with podcasts, they'll hear your voice as well as part of the great table conversation that is Bible. So before we 
we uh, say goodbye. And uh, I want to come back to one point in our conversation today, and that is someone might walk away and say, after listening to this podcast, well, both rabbis just acknowledged that this was written by a bunch of guys who were sitting around a fire and telling stories. And uh, where is the divinity in that? Where's the godliness? Where, why, why should this inspire me any different than um, Romeo and Juliet? Okay? Mm-hmm. Now, I would challenge people to write anything and put it in a shelf <laughs> and come back to it in a year. Write the most profound thing you've ever thought in your entire life and try to come back to it in a year or two years. Right. And you'll realize it, it, it lacks the profundity that you, that you had imagined when you conceived of it. So there is, it is not simply a human document. There is a, a wisdom and a timelessness and eternal nature to the narratives of the Tanakh that somehow, that somehow apply to our lives in modernity as much as it applied to the people's lives in medieval times, in, 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 in Talmudic times, in, in antiquity, in biblical times. How do we wrap our minds around that? The, the divine spirit that runs within the words of the Tanakh. That's, that's the answer. My, my teacher, Rabbi Schulweis, Harold Schulweis, used to warn us against either or theological questions. Either it was written by God and handed down on Mount Sinai, and every word is holy and sacred and true, or it's just a human book and it's no more valuable than Romeo and Juliet or, or the program they hand you at Dodger Stadium. That's a very bad apposition because he would say, for Shulweis said, that the locus of God, the place where God lives in our world is within. The human being is created in the image of God. Each of us carries sparks of God within us. And sometimes if we work really hard uh, at ourselves and in the world, we can locate the divinity within and express it. The text is a partnership, like everything else in the world, between human effort and God's inspiration and God's truth. What we have to do in reading it is to do a process of refining and locate what is human in the text and what was the divine spark, the divine theme, the divine power that was encoded in the words of this text. Every biblical text is that partnership between the human voice and the divine voice. And that's why it's open to interpretation. That's why it's internally relevant. And that's why we have the power to criticize it. When I'm criticizing the Bible and I say, oh, this one, this I can't deal with, that's that human that human element that was tied to its time and place and cultural context. But there's things in the Bible that surprise me all the time and make me stop and say, oh, wow, now I see my world differently. That's the light of the divine, the light of God that is coded in those words. Well, on behalf of Rabbi Feinstein, myself, and the entire clergy at Valley Beth Shalom, we want to thank you for joining us for this session of Torah on the Go. And we invite you to join us in this partnership between us and God in reading the Tanakh, in reading the meta narrative of our people. And we look forward to, uh, to learning with you real soon. Thanks for being with us. Now drive careful. Mm-hmm.